And let's pray. Lord, as we come to your word, Lord, I pray that you will give us your wisdom, give us your insight, give us the message, Lord. Lord, we just want to come to you and humbly ask, Lord, please, tell us, Lord, what you want us to learn out of this text. Tell, teach us, Lord, what you want us to know and, and, and something about you and who you are, Lord, so that we can live in a way that's pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so today we're going to cover um, basically the ark and the flood. So we're going from Revelation. Uh, Re- Revelation. We're going from Genesis. Yeah, that's a, that'd be a big stretch. We're going from Genesis chapter six, verse thirteen, to chapter eight, uh, nineteen, verse nineteen. That we're, but we're doing it in broader brush strokes as well. So we're not sort of verse by verse by verse. Um, we're, we're looking at it in, in pictures. Now, remember, there's a whole reason that we get it, got an ark and a flood, and it was based on what we spoke about last week, which is that incredibly interesting passage about the fallen angels procreating with human women, creating human hybrids, but not only the, the, the human hybrids that were created, which were men of renown and giants, you know, and we hear of them replayed in other cultures, Romans and Greeks, through um, people like Achilles and Hercules and Atlas, these demigod beings that um, we hear in, in all different cultures, these heroes of old that were, you know, the son of Zeus and, the, and had, had the, um, the, the mother was a human woman. So we looked at that and we looked at how this Genesis 6 account is actually confirmed throughout cultures, all throughout history. This idea that these gods, or in Christian sense, fallen angels, procreated with human women. We learnt also that it wasn't just the human line that was defiled, but it said all flesh, right? And, uh, and, and the beasts were defiled in some way. And we, and we looked at how uh, the gods of, um, again, Greeks and others, they had Pan, didn't they? And he was like a boy with a calf's body. And they had... Um, plenty of others that were hybrids between animal, human, and a demonic, and a god kind of hybrid, right? And uh, and so they had so uh, manipulated the genome. In fact, the word used of Noah, when it said he was righteous, it says he was perfect in his genealogies. It's talking about genetics is in there. So he was undefiled, his family was undefiled, and he was saved in the ark. Satan, remember, we were talking about how this battle between God and Satan, obviously it's not a fair fight, God can squash him, but God is legal and he won't do anything unjustly. And so Satan, at the fall, he felt he got a victory, um, but then God, in the same breath as bringing the, the curses and the judgment on the man, the woman, and the snake and the earth, uh, he preaches the gospel and says, hey, look, the serpent, the seed of the serpent will bite the heel of the seed of the woman, but the seed of the woman will crush his head. And there we have the prophesied destruction or the crushing of Satan fulfilled in the cross, the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus. And so this had been prophesied. And like I said, as we look through the prophecies in scripture, if you watch where the prophecies are given and then you see how Satan changes tact, Satan's listening to the prophecies from the prophets. He heard what happened in Genesis 3 and he started thinking, well, I need to start wiping out the line. How does he do it? Well, there's two sons, Abel and Cain. I'm going to use one to kill the other. Therefore, one will be defiled and unusable and the other will be dead. And the line of this offspring, the seed of the woman that will eventually kill Satan, will be cut off. But God had another plan. Seth, the one who means appointed, Seth was born. And then we had the Sethite line and and that line there. So uh, again, though, you'll see there's prophecies about David. And then all of a sudden, Satan's trying to cut off the royal line. And they're trying to hide babies and they're trying to, you know, they're trying to make sure the line, the royal line of David never gets cut off. Why? Because when prophecies are given, Satan listens and he tries to cut those things off. It never works. It keeps failing. He doesn't realize that God's word won't return void. He thinks that somehow he can wrangle it to cut it off. And, and we looked at how all, pretty much all of history, including biblical history, uh, is, is this these God's making a move and the enemy's making a move. Satan's trying to cut off the line so the Messiah can't come and God is constantly delivering. There's always babies being killed. Moses, you know, he was, they tried to kill him. They had to put him in a basket. See, that was Satan inspiring Pharaoh to wipe out the children so there could be no progeny. Right? That's, again, even in Jesus' day, what was Herod doing? 
He, he says all the male children under two. He's trying to kill the baby. Satan's always the aborter of the child and God is always the rapture and the rescuer of the child. Right? God, in the motif of scripture, in the character of God and Satan, one is the aborter of children. One is the one who tries to kill the early church through Saul. The one who tries to cut off um, Jesus, who tries to cut off Moses, who tries to kill when, when the thing is young. And, and God is the one who delivers and raptures and rescues and preserves. Right? So this is, and this happens in our lives too. When you first lead someone to the Lord, that is the most dangerous time. Satan comes after the baby and tries to kill the baby you know, spiritually. So, and this is why we need to be, be on guard. And that's why we were saying the abortion debate is actually a lot bigger. It is a, it's terrible in what it is, but it's also a sign of the character and the nature of Satan that he loves to abort the child before it can um, achieve its purpose and its prophecy. So this is the wickedness that's on the face of the earth. And now God needs to make a move because the, the genome's about to get totally polluted. And, and you can't have Nephilim in Jesus' line, can you? You're not going to have demonic seed with the seed of the Son of God. No way. You can't. So, so this is the, uh, the, the scene in which um, God says... Um, God had, it says he, has beca he became sorry that he made man. He, he repented that he made man. Right, so that's, they're sad words, probably some of the saddest words in the Bible. Um, so God decided that he would wipe out mankind. Remember, he, he wiped out all the men, of all, everyone on the earth, right, except for Noah. But he also wiped out all the animals. You see what's happening there too? Like we, we see the animals there and they've become defiled. God's not just wiping out the humans. He's wiping out the animals. He's saving all the animals on a boat. Now, he could have used some other different means. Maybe he could have used fire or something else. He decided to use a flood. We don't even question it. Why do you use a flood? Right? But it's something that would actually wipe out all the beasts too in all the crevices. Everything you know, could get wiped out um, that, were, that was being interfered with um, genetically. And... Uh, and, it, and, the, and God is always just in the way he deals out punishment, right? So it says, look, because you have filled the earth with violence, and this is where now into verse, the first verse that we're looking at today, verse 13, it says, um, God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. They'd filled the earth with violence. What's going to happen? The earth will open up. There's going to be earthquakes and schisms and tsunamis and you know, water breaking out of the earth. It's the earth that killed the people in that day. Why? Because the people filled the earth with violence. There's something about this where God, when, when the blood of Abel cried out from the earth, then the judgment of God came. And also the crops couldn't, you know, couldn't work the crops anymore. And a curse came on Cain as well. And he wasn't going to be fruitful in in getting crops and things anymore either. So there's something that happens in the natural order of things. When we sin, something happens to creation. We know, Romans tells us that all earth is groaning. Creation is groaning under our sin. What exactly does it mean? You know, and we find passages like this that shows that something happens to the earth and the earth gets vengeance. Another one is when the children of Israel um, were in slavery in Egypt for 400 years, the land of Canaan, the promised land, is all being filled up uh, by these wicked armies, actually children of Nephilim, a lot of these different tribes, again. And they committed so much wickedness, uh, even towards the end, they're sacrificing their own children to gods to get better harvests. So wicked. It says, um, the, uh, it, it said, the land vomited them out. So when the children of Israel came and drove out the armies, what did God see it though? As. He saw it as the land vomiting out these people. God had allowed 400 years of this wickedness and sin and demonic stuff and wickedness in Canaan. And then God used the tool of the Israelites to drive them out. But what did he describe it as? The earth vomited them out. There's something about the earth. The earth does something. that It responds to sin, especially to murder. To violence and murder, the earth seems to respond. And in our own examples of, of prayer walks and testimonies too, we find that, you know, if, some, if there's been a death in an area or, you know, has been an Aboriginal massacre site or something, you know, the, the death rate in those towns or the, you know, the weird stuff that's happening, you know, there, there's problems over that whole land, over those whole areas, you know, the earth itself, I will destroy them with the earth, he says, and those that murder and kill and fill with violence, God destroys them with the earth in some sense as well, there's, there's something... Uh, in, the, in those areas. 
So then he says, make yourself an ark of gopher wood. We don't know what that wood is. Um, it would have had to be very strong, I'm guessing, because he used it to build an ark to withstand incredible um, natural forces. He says, make rooms in the ark, cover it inside and outside with pitch, uh, and this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. Uh, you'll make it, you should make a window for the ark, and you shall finish it to a cubit from above, and set the door of the ark on its side. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. So you've got this big boat. Um, we've got the dimensions there. The pitch was on, normally to waterproof something, and it was probably a pine pitch, not necessarily a bitumen pitch, but it's like a sealant, right? It's a sort of sticky substance you apply. It's normally applied to the outside to waterproof, but God said also to apply it to the inside. Spiritually, this makes sense because in the New Testament, under the New Covenant, we are indwelt with the Spirit and the Spirit is outpoured. The Spirit is in and out. And the pitch could actually look like a picture of that when we look spiritually and symbolically. Others have suggested that the pitch was put on inside and out so that one day, maybe in the last days, it can be found and it will be preserved because the wood would rot away otherwise. But it's been put, it's been put in pitch, which means it could last thousands of years. That's an interesting speculation, isn't it? Is the ark going to be found in the last days? Where is the ark? And we'll look at that in, in a few verses later as well. Um, so, and, and then when I was doing this study, I had a third thought, um, is that Noah was, was building this thing for 120 years. Right? If he was cutting down the trees earlier on, they would have rotted. So maybe he was, as he went, he covered it in pitch. Maybe it's a practical thing. That's just my third thought. The other two sound more um, spiritual and interesting though. So take your pick. Um, but these dimensions too, these are, when numbers are in the Bible, numbers are in the Bible for a reason, right? So 300 cubits, 300 is the number of God's remnant, right? God's people, 300, Gideon's 300, right? 300, when we find that in the scriptures, generally a, a, talking about God's people. Um, when we, the number 50 is the number of the Holy Spirit, yeah? and we get that through Pentecost, right? And, and, uh, and then 30 is the, is the number of spiritual maturity. And remember, this boat that's being built is a symbol. Peter talks about it as, you know, like Noah went through the floods. It was like baptism, right? The wrath of God comes, but we're preserved within the ark. Jesus is the ark, or he's the door to the ark. Maybe the, the ark is the church. Jesus is the door, the only way in. So depending on how you look at the analogy there, um, it's, it's inside and out, indwelt and outpoured, the Holy Spirit. But it's the spiritual mature, 30, right? It's the remnant of God, the 300. It's those who have the Spirit of God, right? 50. It's those that are preserved. And this gives us a little bit of a clue about who is, you know, what types of people are going to be saved. And then we read Jesus' words and we find that the 10 virgins, five were ready, five weren't. They're all virgins. They're all Christians. They're all God's people, okay? Because they're all virgins, so they're all God's people. But five went in and five didn't. So... Do we now have some more supporting stuff? Because Jesus said, not as in the days of Noah, he said just the same exact way it was in the days of Noah, so it shall be in the last days. That's when you interpret what the Hebrew is, that's what it says, just as in, in the exact same way. So the kinds of things that were happening, the wickedness, the debauchery, the demonic stuff, happens again in the end. God provides an ark, we're delivered. Doesn't destroy the world by flood or water, but by fire. Yet, just as Lot was saved before the fire, Noah was saved before the flood, so we are saved before the great, the, the, the outpouring of God's wrath that will come upon the earth in the second part of the tribulation. He, he goes on to say, And behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth. So it's not Noah's flood, is it? Whose flood is it? It's God's flood, right? Um, to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing, of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds after their kind, of animals after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind. Two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive." How many of each kind did Moses take on the ark? Sorry? Two 
How many of each kind did Moses take on the ark? Oh, Moses didn't take any. Uh, how can you trust? You can't even trust your own thoughts. Could you be wrong about your eternal salvation? That's, a trick. that's it. That's a, that's a gospel trick to get people to stop trusting their own proud opinions. It humbles the atheist, but it was probably inappropriate for here. Okay, so so there's but to answer n- answer it for Noah. Yeah. Oh. Okay, so two, seven of the unclean, uh, of the clean, seven of the clean. It's weird though. How did Noah know what was clean and unclean until the law was given in Leviticus? Interesting, isn't it? Maybe some of these statutes are eternal. Well, that's it. <laughs> But he instructs him, you need to take two. And, yeah, but God brings them, is, is right. Um, Thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so he did. So he did everything that God asked him. Not like Saul later on who decides um, when God says, wipe them all out. And he goes, oh, look, I kept some. And there's some for you. We'll give you the best, Lord. We'll keep some. We're, we're, and things are great, right? And God's like, uh-uh, I'm stripping the kingdom from you this day. You're, you're gone. Okay, it goes on to say in in chapter 7, Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, because I've seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. You shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, a male and his female, two of each animals that are unclean, a male and his female, also seven each of birds of the air, male and female, to keep the species alive on the face of all the earth. For after seven more days I will cause it to rain, on the earth, 40 days and 40 nights, I'll destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I've made. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the floodwaters were on the earth. So, you know, Noah, you know, Noah was a bit experienced, wasn't he? He's like around 500 when this stuff's happening. Think of all the wisdom that, that he would have accrued in that time. And he was righteous and they were closer to Adam and Eve. So they didn't have as many genetic mistakes as we did. So they were probably very brilliant. They'd probably advanced to maybe, I don't know how, how close to our civilization is today, but in those 1,600 years from the creation to, to when this was happening. You think about that. So people say, well, how did Noah build the, the boat? You know, how could have he done it? Well, firstly, we don't know that he didn't hire people. We don't know if he was an expert shipbuilder. Right? We don't know how much help he had. We know he had a whole lot of time. We don't know how big he was. Maybe they were bigger back then. I don't know. Right, so, but there's... That's it. Well, yeah, we'll look at that too. So there's plenty of there's plenty of um, you know plenty of explanation you know of how Noah could possibly do this. Uh, in the Bill Nye and Ken Ham debate, um, Bill Nye tries to bring up a few of these things, and but they're old fallacies that can be easily easily refuted as well. So um, let me just say this right from the outset: the language is universal, not local. Okay, because there are people today that try to say that this flood was just in the local area, right? It wasn't worldwide. Okay? And, and people want to say that because they want to be able to agree. Well, I'll say the Christians that say that, they say that because they want to agree with secular scientists and archaeologists, right? They want to be able to agree with the account um, of evolution and how the, the fossil records came. They don't want to have to have the Bible contending with science. But the Bible contends with false science really, really well, and uh, and it's uh, you know and so to compromise is something we they don't need to do, and and some of the words that, that are used here it says all flesh so that doesn't sound local to me, um, it says I'll destroy with the earth it didn't say part of the earth or with the area right so we start to have this language here, um, and and look I think God probably gave more instructions than what's here because. Because it says about Noah, he did everything of the Lord that he had commanded him. So I think God may have given him a few more tips on on how to do all this. But let's just have a look at the ark. Because today we're just basically going to look at the ark and we're going to look at the flood. And the ark, there's some questions that pop up, right? So was the ark big enough? Okay, because we can't, that's what everyone says. How can can all these animals fit inside the ark? So that's that's a great question that the, the world asks. Well, like I said, we've got... Um, the dimensions there, 300 cubits by 50 by 30. Now, a cubit is the length from your top of your fingers to your elbow. That's a cubit. Okay, but everyone's arms are different, aren't they? 
So the, the thing is with a cubit is we don't have an exact measurement for what it was, but there were things like the Egyptian cubit, the royal cubit, the regular cubit. Um, so, but if we take what answers in Genesis think is probably most likely and what they based their ark on is the Egyptian cubit, um, we find that the size of it would be 155 metres long. Think about that, 155 metres long. It's long, isn't it? Um, and then 26 metres wide and 16 metres high. So that's a massive structure. And again, Dad's gone and seen that. It's and it's massive. The biggest, <laughs> it, wooden structure in the, world. the biggest wooden structure in the world is the, um, is the built ark over there in Kentucky. So, so look, it's big. Um, and how much room does it have into it? Well, um, accounting for the 15% um, loss of space due to the curvature of the boat, right? It would have been curved. Um, 450 semi-trailers worth of room. Um, or 125,000 sheep-sized animals could fit in there. And that's not a bad number to think about. So think of the size of a sheep. 125,000 of them could have fit on this on this boat, right? So now we need to know, well, okay, how many animals would have been there? In Genesis 7, 21 to 23, it says it was only land-dependent animals that needed to be preserved. So, see, birds need to land at some point too. So even though they fly, they were counted. And he wanted seven of them as well. Um, maybe some insects, like butterflies and moths. That makes sense. They're a bit delicate, aren't they? But probably a lot of the insects could have survived. But, you know, however many the... the um, he took, he need of them, he would have taken. It's not fish. Fish can swim, <laughs> they're fine. He didn't have all these little fish bowls on the ark. Um, but, so, so if we add up, if we, the number of species according to a, a report done, known species, according to a report done in 2014 is 1.8 million. So you've got 1.8 million, 98% of those are fish, invertebrates, or non-animals like plants. So that just wipes a ton of them away, doesn't it? So 1.8 million, but only 2% of those would be the type, kind of types that would go onto the ark. And that number is 34,000. Okay, you could already fit how many? 125,000 if they were sheep sized. And you've got 35,000 total species. However, the Bible doesn't use the word species, it uses the word kind, which is min, M I N, in Hebrew. And that is basically, for a species, think about, uh, these are all different species. A wolf, a chihuahua, a dingo, a poodle, a bulldog. That's, they're all different species. They're all counted as different species, right? But in regards to kinds, they're one kind. What kind are they? The dog kind. So God, has, yeah, God had his own definition system. And we have to go, well, how does that fit with when scientists talk? Is it in the family? Is it in the species level? Where is it? right? But, um, but it's mainly probably in the family level, which is above the species level. So we don't need as many kinds, right? Because a couple of wolves probably produced, or wolves' ancestors maybe, probably has, a, has the right DNA to be able to produce all the dogs we have today, right? So we just need two, not thousands, right? So if we then, so if we go from the 34,000 species, that equates to only 1,400 kinds, 1,400 kinds. However, there's two of each, right, male and female. And with the birds, there's seven. And there's a lot of bird species. They're heavily weighted towards the bird species, and there's seven of them. So the number at, at absolute most, this is according to answers and Genesis scientists, 7,000 animals. But it could be far less than that. Okay, so you need 7,000 animals. You have room for 125,000 sheep-sized animals. How big were the animals? Everyone's thinking, oh, this massive dinosaur is like leading into the, right? Well, he would have taken babies, wouldn't he? He could have taken eggs if he wanted. He would have taken juveniles at least, right? So, and, and you can actually look at the percentages on how many animals are below 10 kilograms. And you can do all that math too if you want to go real deep into this. Um, but have a think about it. God would have brought younger, if not maybe juvenile um, animals to know it. Why? When they get off the ark, they're going to live longer so they can procreate more and fill the earth. That was God's command straight off when they get off the ark. That makes sense, isn't it? Have younger animals. They're going to be able to procreate for longer, but they're more resilient too, aren't they? And they're smaller, right? Less mess, less food, okay? Less problems. So, so given all that, 
um, you can see 125,000 sheep size. You only need 7,000 anyway. And, you know, so even if some were big, some were small, you've got so much room on there. In fact, it's weird the amount of room that there is on the ark. You know, th there's too much room, right? So what, rather than saying, you know, could, oh, the animals couldn't all fit on the ark, it's like, why did God make such a big ark? That's what the world should be asking us. Why would God make such a huge ark when there's only this many kinds in your definition? Right? That's the real question. But I actually think there's this period where Noah, uh, there's a seven-day period before the ark's finished and the floods come. And Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Do you know why I think there was plenty of room left in the ark? There was plenty of room left in the ark because God wanted more people to be on the ark, didn't he? He was calling. He wanted more. He's the king who said, my house must be full. Isn't he? The king that, that sent out the servants and they said, oh, they don't want to come. They're too busy. I'll go out to the highways and the byways then and get everyone you can to get in here because my house must be full. There was room on the ark. That's God's mercy. He wanted more on the ark, but there was, uh, there was, there was no one. So, the, so that's the first question. Could the animals fit on the ark? And the second thing I just want to mention here briefly is how, does the, uh, how did the ark survive? Right? It's a wooden structure. It's, think of what happens to the earth. Like the flood is, like everything, every mountain is, uh, is covered in water, right? So, and, and it rips out of the earth. Imagine the seismic activity, the, the, all the debris of the planet, you know, flowing. You know what it's like, when, how dangerous it is jumping in an overflowing river that's flooding. There's all logs and stuff traveling down. How does this wooden structure survive? Well, expert boat builders uh, in modern times have said that the dimensions of the ark would actually make it incredibly stable on rough waters. Remember, it's not designed to have a motor and to move. <laughs> it didn't really need to go anywhere, right? It, it's more shaped like a barge where it just needs to be resilient, right? It doesn't need to, to necessarily um, travel anywhere. Um, it would be incredibly stable on rough waters and that it's possible to make an extremely strong structures out of wood if they're designed in the right way. And uh, as I was preparing for this, I was looking at some of the boat building designs and all the incredible stuff people have done throughout the centuries with wood. And if you put them in different spots and peg them in certain ways, the amount of strength you can get out of it. And so scientists today have found that the dimensions of the boat were actually an incredibly strong and stable boat. But also, this is a thought I hadn't had till I came across it um, in preparation for this, is that Noah probably didn't um, have his ark being built down in a valley. He was probably up on a fairly high place or a mountain, because then what would happen is that all the oceans, all the earth ruptured and all the water came out and the rain came down. As all that stuff started to settle, the oceans joined. Okay, it's, that's all happening first and he's still on dry land. And then by the time it reaches him, it's all pretty much settled. And there's about a two kilometer drop between him and the bottom of the earth. So if there's earthquakes and tsunamis and that kind of thing happening, well, that, you're safe in deep water from a tsunami. Do you know that? You're safe in deep water. It can't affect you in deep water. So he would have had a two kilometer gap, deep water, right, to protect him from seismic activity. Um, the, the other question about this arc is, you know, is it, is it strong? Yes. Is it stable? Well, yes. Is it survivable? People are like, how could you be with all those animals on a boat? And how would you breathe? And how, you know, how animals going to the toilet and all those practical stuff. But Answers in Genesis has actually done a whole lot of work in this area. And we don't know exactly how they had ventilation and what their, you know, their plumbing situation was with animal waste and, and all of that. But they've done a whole lot of um, different hypothetical um, situations based on you know, te technology that would have been probably available in that day. Now remember, the ancient civilizations built things that we can't even build, like the pyramids, right? So we often, science tries to tell us, oh, these are ancient men, they can't read or write, they're like dumb cavemen or something. No, these are probably quite brilliant people. God spoke directly to Noah too, so he, he can give them some clues uh, as well. But, um, but anyway, there's no problem with the survivability of the time, uh, for that whole year. It was a whole year there on the ark, longer than a year. They're, they're on that ark, I think it was 300 and... 77 days, I think it was. I've got it here later. But so, yes, this makes sense, right? The, the ark is strong, stable, and survivable, and it's big enough. This all just makes a lot of sense. God led the animals, wiped out everyone else, and preserved Noah within, within the ark. 
So let's move on to the flood. Um, So Noah with his sons, his wife and his sons' wives, went into the ark because of the waters of the flood, of clean animals, of animals that are unclean, of birds and of everything that creeps on the earth. Two by two they went into the ark to Noah, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened and the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. So it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, but the earth opened up as well and, uh, and water came out of aquifers underneath the earth, underneath the earth's crust. On the very same day, Noah and Noah's sons, Shem, Ham and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. So there's eight people. They and every beast after its kind, all cattle after their kind, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, and every bird after its kind, every bird of every sort. And they went into the ark to Noah, two by two of all flesh, in which is the breath of life. So those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Now the flood was on the earth forty days. The waters increased and lifted up the ark. So the, see, the water didn't, didn't lift the ark immediately, did it? So again, this maybe he was on a high place, a mountain. The waters increased and lifted up the ark and it rose high above the earth. Uh, the waters prevailed, which means you know, there were um, mighty waters. Uh, the waters prevailed and greatly increased on the earth and the ark moved about on the surface of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. Now, in the Bible says in Psalm 104, it describes that during the flood, the mountains r- were raised and the valleys lowered. What that means is, if you rewind that, is that in the times of Noah, the mountains weren't as high and the valleys weren't as deep, which means we don't have to think, oh, what, Mount Everest was once covered. No, that probably happened in the flood or soon after. Okay, so the mountains and the valleys weren't as high. So when we're starting to think of the credibility of the flood narrative, we need to be thinking about you know, some other scriptures here, like in in Psalm 104, which seems to allude to that. The waters prevailed 15 cubits upward, and the mountains were covered, and all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, all that was on the dry land died. So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping thing and bird of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. So, I mean, this is an incredible event, isn't it? I wonder if we get used to it. But think about Noah. He's building this boat. God's going to kill the whole earth. And he literally had to get into a boat <laughs> that he'd built. And, and then everything, there's just water everywhere. And he's in this boat and he's the only one. You know, he's, he, when they get off the boat, he doesn't have any relatives, the people that were in his street, people he preached to, they're all gone. It's just the eight of them now. Um, so, I mean, it's pretty full on. But let's think about this flood. Um, people ask, how, do, how did the water cover the earth and where did, the wa- where did all the water go? So again, um, the language that we're finding here is global. It's all all those who had the breath of life in their nostril, right? There's no, we can't find anything in scripture that, that says this is just a local flood, right? And that, um, yeah, and that, and, and, but Christians, some Christians desperately want to believe that because they want to be atheistic evolutionists. They want to be able to believe that scientists account for fossils is due to old ages, not through a catastrophic event that happened in Noah's day. And it's compromised and it's not needed. It's clear in the, in the, in the text here. Um, it says the water broke out from deep springs within the earth. Uh, it would have it fell obviously in the form of rain, rained for forty days and forty nights. Um, but you know what? There's there is enough water currently on planet Earth to cover the whole surface, two point seven kilometers deep in water. So the whole Earth, if you leveled the the mountains and raised the valleys, there's enough water to cover the entire planet um, currently, right? So there's plenty, there's plenty of water. And they think there's a huge amount of water still underneath the crust of the earth. There's still water there. Um, but again, people ask, so where did all the water go then? Um, 
But a great response I heard, well, it's called the blue planet for a reason. <laughs> you know? It's still there. <laughs> you ever seen a globe? It's all water. <laughs> it's like there's countries here and there. But there's a lot of water left. Um, but also uh, there's language here that says, you know, God caused, he, he, um, he caused the water to recede continually. So it was a gradual natural drain off. It probably went back into maybe some part went under the earth. Some part was evaporated. Um, but again, the vast majority of it is here. It probably had deeper valleys. Like I said, there was shallower valleys then. So it can contain it all. So there's a ton of water. We don't need to know where all the water goes. We just need to look at a globe and see why it's blue. Um, so l let's think about this. Um, if, if it was just, if it was a worldwide flood, there'd be evidence, wouldn't there? Right? If, if it, if like the secularists say oh, there was no flood or like compromised uh, Christians say oh, it was just local, right? That we would, if they were right, uh, if they were wrong and we were right, it was a global flood, there would be some evidence. Wouldn't you expect to find, and this is answers in Genesis language, wouldn't you expect to find billions of dead things buried in, lock, in rock layers, not locally, but laid down by water all over the earth? Um, what else would you, just if there was a global flood, let's just have a think, would you expect to see, wouldn't a flood produce billions of fossils as, fo as fossils would, are, need, are needed to be buried rapidly through a catastrophic event in order to be preserved? Because if it was over millions of years, they would decay, birds would come and pick the bones, other animals would destroy it, it would rot away, wouldn't it? How do we get so many fossils all over the planet? How, how would we get billions of fossils? You only get billions of fossils. There's something catastrophic. Buried them real quick. You'd even expect to find food in some of their mouths or they might be giving birth or in some kind of activity that shows they were just living their life at the time, not that they died of old age disease or had been hunted down with an animal. You would expect to see well-preserved animals with, uh, that were in the state of living, maybe eating, some of them giving birth. That's what you'd expect to see if there was a global flood. Um, you'd also expect to find seashells on high mountains and in deserts. And at the lowest parts, land animal bones and fossils. So that's what you'd expect to see. What do we find? Well, we find billions of dead things buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the earth. We find billions of fossils all over the planet that have been perfectly preserved. We find them with food still in their mouth, undigested. We find them giving birth at the time or one animal eating another animal. That's exactly what we find. We find seashells on high mountains, we find seashells in deserts, and we find land animals that have no right to be in, in other places. We find their fossils there too. So science confirms the Bible, doesn't it? And we don't need to compromise. So often what happened when, the, when evolution started to really take hold in the scientific community, Christian, a lot of Christians freaked out. So we're going to look so incredible if they're going to prove, science is proving now that this couldn't have happened this way. So they start to look at the text and they don't look at the plain reading anymore and they start to try to squeeze and change and, and go, oh, we could just say this means that and this, that was local. And that, you know, but in the end, there's going to be egg on their face, isn't it? You know, they've messed with the testimony of God in Scripture, who is the only eyewitness that's alive today. And they've, and they've tried to change it and manipulate it and reinterpret it. And at the end of the day, they're going to be the ones that are looking foolish. Okay, so we've gone from the ark to the flood to Noah's deliverance. Then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters receded. The fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were also stopped and the rain from heaven was restrained and the waters receded continually from the earth. At the end of the 150 days, the waters decreased. Then the ark rested in the seventh month, the 17th day of the month, on the mountains of Ararat. And the waters decreased continually until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. So it's starting to recede now. The, the ark lands on the mountains, plural, of Ararat. So these mountains, um, which are today called the Armenian Plateau, are in the region of modern Turkey and extending into Iran. And their elevation succeeds 5,200 meters, so quite a high mountain ranges of many mountains. Um, many people believe that the ark came to rest on Mount Ararat, which is different, right, to this range. Mount Ararat's just one mountain and is in Turkey, um, whereas this range includes Mount Ararat but extends into Iran. The problem with that is um, Mount Ararat is a, uh, is a dormant volcano with two peaks and looks like it would have. 
the volcano has erupted post the time of Noah's day. So what happens to wood within a volcanic eruption? It's going to be destroyed. Yet some people do believe strongly that it, the ark is in Turkey and on Mount Ararat. And it may be, but there is some evidence there that says that maybe it's not. Um, there have been many reported sightings of the ark over the years. None of these have been authenticated. So where the ark is, it's still a mystery. Whether God wants to bring it out in the last days, yep. It's in Kentucky. <laughs> you found it. It goes on to say, So it came to pass at the end of 40 years that Noah opened the window of the ark, which he had made. Um, so, the, so the window was probably a strip along the whole ark at the top, right, on both sides, and a roof over it. It wasn't just like he had just had one little window and the giraffe's head sticking out, like in the children's pictures. It's, it would have been... Uh, a whole lot of ventilation. Um, uh, then he sent out a raven, which kept going to and fro until the waters had dried up from the earth. So ravens are hardy birds and can survive on a broad range of food types. This bird um, found food outside the ark and therefore didn't return. So that's what happened to the raven. But Noah was not sure if it was safe for them to disembark. So Noah's being patient, careful, making sure everything's fine. Um, he also sent out for himself a dove, to see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot. And she returned into the ark to him, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Local flood? Whole earth? Come on. So he put out his hand and took her and drew her into the ark to himself. So the dove, however, needed fresh plant material and dry ground, but could not find any. Therefore, she returned to Noah. Right, so raven eats anything. The dove's more picky, so he used the dove. Couldn't find the kind of food that doves and humans might eat. By this, Noah knew that he and his family could not survive outside the ark yet. Verse 10 says, And he waited yet another seven days, and again he sent the dove out from the ark. So this indicates Noah was following a calendar based on a seventh-day week. Right, why has he got these seven days stuff? Where would he get that from? Weren't they long age days and there was gaps in here and whatnot? Each day is a thousand years. Why is he following a seven-day calendar already? Why do we even have a seven-day week now? Right? I think that's some of the best evidence that there was six literal days because we have six literal days now. Right? Doesn't that make sense? There's no other... Like when we talk about um, months and we talk about years, it's because... The journey of the earth around the sun, the tilt, the t how long it takes for the earth to till, that's a month, that one's a year, right? Where do we get a week from? Oh, there's no astronomical phenomena at all to get a week. And yet, every culture across the planet have seven-day weeks. Well, Noah had a seven-day week. He would have got that from, you know, Adam and Eve and, well, not particularly, necessarily Adam himself, but he would have come from the account, the creation account, the seven-day week. Yeah, true. Then the dove came to him in the evening, and behold, a freshly plucked olive leaf was in her mouth, and Noah knew that the waters had receded from the earth. So this choice of food indicated to Noah that the land was beginning to produce again, and his family would survive outside the ark. The olive tree is extremely hardy and, to, and can grow on most barren slopes. Um, however, olives can sprout from wet ground, and doves won't rest or nest on such a surface, and the tree was not a sufficient size so Noah waited some more. See, so he's just testing. This is, he wasn't just going, oh, I'll do a raven. Oh, I'll send a dove, another dove. Right? He's trying to work out when it's safe for his family. So he waited yet another seven days and sent out the dove, which did not return again to him anymore. And it came to pass in the 600 and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, that the waters were dried up from the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and indeed the surface of the ground was dry. So that's, uh, he would have been pretty happy. The ground looked dry. But Noah still waits a little longer, and in the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dried. They'd been in the ark for 378 days. And Noah was 601 years old. Right? So he's happy to get out of there. All the children fighting, the dogs barking. You know, he's like, ugh, dry ground finally. 
Then God spoke to Noah saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and cattle and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth so that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply uh, on the earth. So God again repeats this command that's so important to him. Um, Just like at the beginning, uh, when he created all kinds of animals and man, he says, be fruitful and multiply. That is, this is part of what we are, and it, and it pictures spiritual things. And the fact that um, two men or two women can't procreate is actually part of the reason why uh, homosexuality is considered unnatural, because it's the barren. There, there's a barrenness in homosexuality. See, in Christianity, we as humans, we actually a picture of Christ, right? The, uh, um, the we ha- we have the the picture of the. Uh, the, man go, the man goes into the woman, produces children, and um, just as the bride goes into his, his church and produces converts. We, these are the pictures, the fruitful pictures or the pictures of procreation in the scriptures are incredibly important. So it's, it's, it's a satanic thing. It's a satanic idea and a blasphemous idea and a slight on God's character. The fact that we have the rise of homosexuality, which is a barren union, and also of sadomasochism, a pain is pleasure. When, when God, one of God's three purposes for marriage was pleasure, unity, pleasure, and to multiply. And, and, and um, multiplication and pleasure, Satan's had a go at. Right? And unity. <laughs> Look at all the divorce rates out there. He is trying to assault it. Why? Because something about marriage teaches us about God. If we have a clear view of marriage and how marriage works, we start to understand Christ and the Father. We start to understand Jesus and his church. And we get an understanding of uh, fruitfulness, faithfulness, and the creation, you know, the creative nature of God. We are procreative because we are created in the creative one's image, right? And as, as we're in society, we distort definitions of various things, how God created natural orders. We start to pollute and destroy and twist in the mind, our minds and in the minds of men the very image of God. And so, these, uh, so the rise of this twisting in the area of procreation uh, in sexuality through sadomasochism and homosexuality is actually a blasphemous and satanic attack to mar God, to mar his, his image and vision and, and who he is to people uh, on the earth. So people can't know God anymore. Do you understand? There's always a big picture. There's the big end game. Satan and God. Satan's trying to rob God from mankind and he's doing all kinds of things. This isn't just about sexuality. This is about twisting and distorting of image and view of the divine uh, of, of God. Okay, so let's finish up here. Um, yeah, so Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him, every animal, every creeping thing, every bird and whatever creeps on the earth, according to their families, went out of the ark. Think about it. They've been in there for 300 and, what was it, 78 days. Um, they... W- there's, they walk out into this place. There's no human life or animal life anymore. Um, they would be able to breathe the wonderful fresh air. The sunlight for the first time would have been a bit dark in the ark as well. They're going out into this new world, I guess like a new Adam and Eve, a recreation of the creation. And the sunlight would have seemed bright to them, um, very bright to them as well. But, they, but most of all, they would have been very grateful to God that they were still alive. <clears throat> uh, the, the main theme here for us and this is what we I want to leave you with the main thing that Noah learnt through the amazing ordeal of the flood was that he needed to trust God and obey him totally he, he did all he was commanded to do he was even very careful when it got to the end to make sure it was the end right he tested and waited and used the raven and the dove and we need to trust him totally Noah left his home and almost everything he owned he trusted God for his family their provision and their safety his father Lamech had died five years before the flood and his grandfather Methuselah died in the year of the flood he was on his own with the opposition of all those around him or was he how much do you trust God do you trust him with your job your money your health your family and your life would have you come into the ark with Noah we can please the Lord greatly when we trust and obey him and he will bring us through any storm. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Let's pray. 
Lord, we just thank you for this account, Lord. It's not a story, it's history. It's, a, it's an account of something happened, Lord. The earth got really bad, like it's going to get again. And you had to wipe everyone out. But Lord, you saved your faithful people. And you were totally trustworthy. And it would have been scary, those huge waves and tsunamis and earthquakes. And everyone else seemed to be stripped from them. And family members, his father and grandfather, before they even got on the ark. And Lord, you were faithful and you protected and you preserved them in the ark. We thank you, Lord, that us who are in Christ Jesus, we enter through that door into your church. And we too, Lord, will be preserved from your wrath. Help us to remain faithful. Help us to trust you in everything, Lord. Because just like you were with Noah, you were totally trustworthy and we have nothing to worry about. In Jesus' name, amen.